Um, we are calling to order the 149th meeting of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission uh, on April 16th at the Heinz uh, Memorial Auditorium. Um, first item on the agenda, actually before we even get to the very first item, um, I wanted to make a, a small announcement. Uh, we've had the first of the commissioner's terms uh, come to a conclusion and the first reappointment of a, of a commissioner. Commissioner Bruce Stebbins um, had completed his three-year term. He was originally appointed by the governor, Governor Patrick, by the Attorney General, Attorney General Coakley, and by the Treasurer, Treasurer Grossman, uh, and he had to be reappointed by a new governor, a new treasurer, and a new Attorney General, and we are pleased that they saw fit to reappoint Bruce to what I think is a now a new, a new five-year term. Yes. Uh, and uh, that was something that we were all, the other commissioners were highly invested in because uh, of the particular, among other things, the particular expertise that Bruce brings in the area of economic development and the leadership role that he's taken in our diversity work and in our promotion of tourism and our support for local businesses and so forth. And we would have been um, heartbroken if this hadn't worked out. I will tell you even, uh, Attorney General Coakley specifically mentioned that uh, she felt strongly that it was important to keep your particular skills uh, part of our package. So uh, congratulations to Bruce. I wanted everybody to know. Thank you. Um, yeah. With that, um, let's do our minutes. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. The uh, minutes are in the, uh, in the meeting packet, the minutes uh, for the meeting of April 2, 2015. Uh, they're in the packet. I would... Um, move their adoption with the usual reservation of our power to change uh, and fix typos and other mechanical errors. Second? Second. I actually did have a couple of comments, um, and I, I've not gone back to check the transcript, and my memory may not be correct here, but uh, at 1039, it says, Chairman Crosby presented on RFA2 schedule extension and reevaluation of economic I think what happened was Chairman Crosby opened discussion on the RFA 1 schedule extension and the reevaluation topic. I don't think I presented that. Yeah, I, think, I think that's right. So okay, we'll correct. change presented to open the discussion on. And, and RFA 1. Um, and then at 11.17, it says Chairman Crosby presented an overview of the plan to move the application. I think actually Chairman Crosby summarized the status of the plan to continue the Region C commercial application. Does that sound right to you? It does. Yeah, okay. Um, so let's make both of those changes. Those are non-mechanical, so right. let's make both of those. Any other um, comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Uh, as you will have noted, Commissioner Cameron uh, is on vacation this week. Let me just say one other thing about the, the minutes. Um, the um, Times now have a hyperlink. Um, uh, since uh, Artem uh, Shtatnov left, uh, the minutes have had Times uh, uh, since Cecilia uh, has been aboard, but not a hyperlink. The hyperlink now goes to the beginning of the YouTube video of the meeting, and then one can easily move the bar on the video to the designated time. These times are synced uh, with the times on the video, uh, not necessarily the times uh, of the day. So uh, it makes it easier to, to make a transition from the minutes to the video. And of course, the, um, the transcript is available uh, on the web as well. Great, great. Um, we're going to change the schedule slightly. The Ombudsman report, which was item number five, we're going to move up um, and ask uh, Ombudsman Ziemba to take over. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, thank you for taking me out of turn. I appreciate that. Uh, by way of updates, uh, we have posted the current RFA 2 deadline for Regency, uh, consistent with the discussion at the last Commission meeting. Our website states that the deadline for the RFA 2 full application for Regency is no sooner than July 10th, approximately 45 days from the prior deadline of May 26th. 
Uh, as discussed at our last meeting, this date will be reviewed as more facts become known about the Regency's applications. Um, another important date uh, is June 16th. That is the scheduled date of the Gaming Policy Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, by June 16th, we hope to have the first organizational meetings of the local community mitigation advisory committees uh, for the East and for the West. Uh, these committees, in tandem with the Community Mitigation Subcommittee to the Gaming Policy Advisory Committee, uh, will be valuable sources of advice to the Commission as we move forward with the Community Mitigation Fund in 2016 and in future years. With that, I turn to uh, a brief discussion of public notice issues in Region C. Uh, commissioners, as you know, applicants are not allowed to proceed to our RFA2 application unless they have been deemed suitable by the Commission. Uh, the IEB uh, is actively reviewing Region C applicants at this time. Uh, in addition to this requirement, uh, the Commission's regulations, 205 CMR 115056, specify that a host community may not hold an election on a gaming proposal until the Commission has determined that the applicant suitable. However, the regulation allows a municipality to proceed with an election before suitability if the governing body of that community votes to do so and a public education campaign is commenced. Uh, we have di had discussions with two communities in Region C, Brockton and New Bedford, that are considering utilizing this exception. Uh, earlier this week, Brockton City Council discussed the matter and referred it to committee. Uh, likely by our next meeting, Brockton would submit, if it chooses to utilize the exception, the necessary draft notice uh, that is required to be sent to citizens explaining that regardless of the local vote, all applica applicants must be deemed suitable by the commission before they can submit a full application to the commission. Brockton would also need to submit a request for a waiver of timing requirements included in our regulation about the sequence of uh, the local votes. Uh, the two votes that I'm speaking about are the vote to proceed in advance of suitability and then the vote to proceed with the scheduling of the referendum. Uh, New Bedford is also considering utilizing this exemption. Uh, its city council uh, on March 30th already voted to utilize the exemption. Uh, the city council has not yet scheduled the date of the referendum. It plans to do so in the very near future. Uh, New Bedford would need to submit the same citizen notice to the commission for its consideration. This notice could be sent to the commission at its next meeting or a future meeting. I note that New Bedford uh, has notified staff how it plans to deal with a sequencing issue in regard to the scheduling of its election shortly after it entered a, into a host community agreement and after the commission extended the date for the RFA-1 uh, substantial completeness date, the applicant submitted a request for the uh, scheduling of, a, of an election of the referendum to the city council. As noted, uh, the city council has not yet scheduled this referendum. Uh, partially in order to meet the sequencing included in our regulations, the applicant um, is considering a plan to withdraw its initial request for an election and then resubmit that <coughs> request now that the uh, suitability, determination, suitability determination has been determined by the City Council. By submitting this new request for an election, the applicant uh, uh, proposes that it will be able to meet the requirement that a governing body approve of moving forward prior to suitability before the applicant submits the request for the scheduling of a referendum. Uh, Council Blue, uh, Deputy Council Grossman, and I believe that this is a reasonable method to comply with complex uh, timing issues in our regulations, together with the complexity of the recent determinations to move the RFA-1 and RFA-2 deadlines for a regency. Uh, the applicant has not submitted uh, any formal request for it determined by the full uh, commission, believes that it is in conformity with our regulations. However, staff uh, did let the applicant know that we would brief the Commission on Regency notice issues and timing uh, today. Uh, with that, Commissioners, I conclude my report. Questions or thoughts? 
John, can you just <coughs> remind us? Uh, I think we had waiver requests in the last one of the last go arounds. Uh, can you just remind us of some of the things the community would need to do in terms of the public information campaign you talked about? So they have to send a notice to uh, registered voters explaining uh, the, the the determination that they ha that communities uh, excuse me that applicants first need to be qualified under our suitability process before they can proceed to RFA two. It makes uh, uh, citizens aware that uh, despite the vote, if an applicant is deemed unsuitable by the commission, they cannot proceed to uh, RFA 2. Um, and then in addition, the regulation calls for uh, other items to inform the general public about that requirement over and above the citizen notice. They just ask for a filing of those uh, with us. Um, so we, we don't have before us the waivers at, at this point, right? No, correct. Um, the city council, in the in the context of uh, uh, Brockton, uh, they did just discussed it this past Monday, and uh, in short order, they're going to take up that request. Right, and the the Brockton applicant has had been found suitable. Two two different parties have now come together, but those parties have been found suitable before. What we're what the IEB is now doing is a sort of suitability update, which is important, but can they technically have complied with the prior um, requirement of having been found suitable? I'll leave this to Council Blue, but I believe our determination has always been that uh, suitability for the context of the Region C application is dependent upon a review of the entire structure for each of the applications. Not, not so the, it's a separate independent. Not the elements, right. It, it would need to be a separate. in the prior application. There are some parties that were included in the prior applications that are not included in this one. So it is an update to some degree, but it is also a new review as well. So they would need to go through that and be found suitable before they can have their election. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and this was, we've done this at least once, right? Was it, how many times have we given this waiver? We gave uh, it to for Boston. For the uh, suitability uh, in advance of, uh, for the election in advance of suitability, I believe it's uh, maybe four or five times. Yeah, so this is um, not an extreme majority. And, and then the, the sequencing issue, I believe that was only in the context of uh, Boston today, where their sequence was uh, slightly out of order. Uh, and then we, uh, we approved the waiver for that sequencing. Right, right. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, so you're not doing, you're done. So are you done? I yes. So. <laughs> okay. I was thinking you were doing Penn National. Sorry. All right. Thank you. We now go back to item number three, administrative update, Executive Director Day. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Under tab uh, 3A, you should find a memorandum and a series of floor plans. And we're asking the Commission today uh, to consider uh, approving those floor plans, but uh, pending final inspection by the IAB as the uh, facility begins to open. So what I'd like to do, if I could, uh, with us today, Lance George, Mike McGrew, and Darlene Whitmore, essentially to discuss the Plain Ridge Casino, Park Casino floor plan. And as well, I think uh, Jennifer Pink and Dane Wigfall are here as well if we have additional questions for them. So with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Lance. Before you, before you start, congratulations on your opening day yesterday. By all accounts from uh, our folks who were there, it was a successful successful start. Parking lot was packed, um, so congratulations. Uh, we, ap we appreciate that. Uh, it was great to have Enrique there. Thank you. Yeah, and maybe I can just say a, a word or two. It was really uh, a great day. Um, there's so much work going on, a lot of activity, a lot of patrons in the racing. Uh, side, a lot of visible upgrades uh, from last year's opening uh, day uh, or, or uh, season, uh, and just a lot of excitement uh, that you could feel, that I could feel, uh, just standing around watching and talking to people, so congratulations. Yeah, we appreciate that. The uh, The hard part now is, is keeping them in the racing area. They want to pop in and see what's going on in the other side <laughs> of the building. <laughs> Uh, though, uh, though typically my colleague Jack Round would be here for an update such as this, we, uh, we couldn't convince him that it made sense to return from vacation early. Um, so we'll give Jack a pass on this one. 
Uh, with me today, I have Michael McGrew, Vice President of Construction for Penn National Gaming. In addition, I have Darlene Whitmore uh, with JCJ Architecture. They have uh, intimate knowledge of, of this project. Darlene's been on the job since prior to, uh, to Penn's involvement, so she can provide great uh, historical context. Michael is on the ground every week and will continue to be on the ground through our opening process. In front of you today, I believe you have several color-coded plans as well as a, a memorandum from, from Ray Porfilio, uh, one of the technical consultants, I, I believe, in Ray's summary. I'm going to read here. The interior design as developed to date is generally consistent with and of a similar quality to the design communicated by the licensee during the, uh, the application process. Clearly, that's, that's what we wanted to read. That's what we expected to see, but good news nonetheless. Uh, I think at this point, that's a good jumping off point for, for Michael and Darlene to walk through at a high level the, uh, the layout of the floor. So without further ado. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, we'd like to go on to the color floor plans, if we could. What we try to demonstrate here is based on the RFA and the final uh, layout and program elements, uh, this is the entire first floor of the facility, uh, demonstrating the different functions and program elements as, as they relate to square footages and an overall perspective of the facility. Um, page two um, is basically just the public area. <coughs> this area is the front of house. Uh, we felt it important to, to show the public uh, areas separate from the back of house to give you a feel for where the public will be in the facility. Um, this includes the gaming floor, lobby, uh, dining bars, retail, uh, simulcast racing, meeting room, public area, restrooms, and racing. Can you, um, oh, you don't have a pointer, do you? Um, no, can, I do not. Can you show where the um, GameSense uh, facility will be? Yeah, do we have a pointer, please? Oh, thank you. Responsible gaming? Yes. Right in this area. Right off the entrance from the garage. Okay, so that's the entrance from the garage. Yes. Right, okay. This is the, the orientation of the facility. Is this the main entry at the right. Port of Cashier? Okay. This is the north entry into the racing area. That's our three major entry points to the facility. Right. Okay. The uh, next slide. Before we leave that one, this okay, is a matter of detail, but those things that look like, those black things that look like sort of like crabs, are they, those are multi, the multiplayer uh, machines? Uh, correct, that is, uh, those are the electronic table game units. That's correct. Right, okay. Okay, slide three basically shows us the back of house areas and shows how it communicates with the uh, front of house space. Uh, that includes our office, state offices, food services, uh, human resources, employee restrooms, and utilities. The next slide is the uh, entire upper level, uh, which we have two levels. Uh, this is the upper level of the racing Building. Mike, excuse me. I'm sorry. Could you go back one 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 step? Okay. Um, there, the the deep red is um, right here. Yeah. Those there are two state offices. There's a deep red there, and there's a deep red up above. There's those one are, there, and those then are there's, both. A, there's a restroom there. Yeah, that's the three areas of the right. Okay. State right. State offices. The, the goal for the state police was to have a dedicated area in the back and then they wanted a, a satellite office closer to the floor in case they needed to get out there quickly. Right. So we were able to accommodate that request. Okay. Great. Okay, this level, uh, floor plan shows the upper level of the racing and simulcast building. Um, it also shows we have intermediate levels that we call mezzanines. Um, they are more uh, back of house areas. Uh, this shows the entire footprint, public and, and back of house space. The next slide basically shows the public space on the second level. This is the, the uh, multipurpose area, banquet space. This is simulcast on this level. 
the uh, next slide basically shows the back of house on the upper level uh, to support the function of that building and the casino. Next slide basically is a blow up of the venues um, to help show a little more in detail the, the, the uh, four main venues we have. We have the food court, uh, which has three venues in it, Be Good Burger, Slice, and The Bean. We also have Revolution, which is the stage bar. And we have Flutie's. And then we have Slacks, which is located in the, the new racing building, which we opened up to, to get the racing building and the uh, casino more contiguous and more efficient. The next slide is the enlargement of this second level. Uh, again, showing the multipurpose area along with the simulcast. Um, make it a little easier to see. Let me go on to the next slide. Well, that's it. <laughs> So as you can see, we've, we've made some minor adjustments from the RFA to the final square footages. That was to basically to get to a more efficient layout. Once we started meshing the, the program together, uh, we made some adjustments to get, get a more efficient layout. You adjusted the number of uh, food areas in the, the food court area, but I'm just curious, how, yes. do, you, how do you select I mean, you get three choices in there now. Are those flexible depending on what the, the market's going to tell you over the first period, uh, first year or so of opening, where they might flip some of those or change them out? Or? Yeah, I'll let Lance speak to that. Are you lobbying for some particular kind of food? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm happy with the Be Good Burger. I'm just <laughs> worried about the other two. Sure. Uh, we have flexibility with the other two. Be good. We have a, uh, a franchise agreement with. I believe it's for a period of five years. So okay. we are, we're we're hand in hand with Be Good for the first five years. Slice and uh, and the Bean are certainly uh, easy enough to change on our end. Okay, but, but you originally had four or five food spots in there originally. I believe we originally had four and. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, but the, the idea was to have a, a coffee shop as well as a pastry shop. And so with the bean, we've combined the two of those. Okay. Uh, Slacks is uh, where the, uh, and roughly where the Flutie pub was orig originally going to be. And that still is accessible from the outside, right? It's that's that correct. entrance that's on the north side. Yes. And is that, is that, um, uh, uh, available for people under 21? It is. That's correct. You can see the, the dark yellow path. That pathway enters from the, the racing or what was the racing facility. It right. is open to all ages. Right. Uh, on that note, can, uh, can we go to the, um, the prior slide, a prior slide where you, um, you can reference all three points of access? Yeah, probably um, go back to the very first slide. I guess it's the first, first or second one. Either, either one. Either. That, that one will work. Um, so if you're in the northernmost, this is the yes. north access into the Bly Racing simulcast building. Yep. This is the Porter Cashier entrance. Yep. And then this is the garage entrance here. But the north one is the only access point between the simulcast and the casino. Correct. Correct. There's no um, there's no other access from racing. Unless right, racing is right here. Space. You come right. right from racing right on up into the right. casino. Right. Yes. There's employee access back of the house so that you can serve food on both places, but but not public access. Correct. Right. Well, the public access enters from the. You kind of come through the main entrance around the core of our service. Yep. Comes back here so we can <coughs> service both sides. Yes. Of the facility. The three control points, uh, the, the, obviously this simulcast and racing building can have under 21. Um, we have three control points right here, a checkpoint, checkpoint here coming in, and another checkpoint right here at the entry. Mm -hmm. 
security posted with uh, with ID scanners yes. in, in those yes. areas. And you expect that maybe 80 percent is that the figure will come on the one from the garage? That, that's a fair estimate. That's fair. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. Are you finished with your presentation? Well, I'll turn it over to uh, our architect, JCJ, uh, Darlene Whitmore, and she can explain about the design concept and how we implemented it. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm going to speak to the design concept and how we integrated that into the interiors. Um, the inspiration for the design for the facility came from the local history of Plainville and the casino site itself, which was built on a working quarry. Um, those elements of a working quarry were built into the design, which were stone, wood, metal, and water, as outlined in our design concept in the RFA. Uh, for the stone, the concept of the quarry is sprinkled throughout the building. Um, upon your first experience arriving onto the site, um, on the exterior is ledger stone towers, which we followed those through into the vestibules of the facility with stone feature walls. Um, at both the main entrance and main entrances of the casino, the racing entrance and the port of entrance. Both entrances are um, very bright and voluminous and contain that continuous ledger feature wall in them. As you enter into um, the casino on the port of side, uh, there are s several locations where we um, feature a granite that's very similar to the um, Babbing tonight, which is the state mineral. And it's a dark, sparkly stone. And we featured that on walls and other locations within the facility, such as uh, the racing entry. When you walk in, there's a curved wall that welcomes you into the racing facility um, <coughs> made with the stone. And we have some um, illuminated displays on that wall. Um, we also have illuminated uh, feature columns as you enter from the Porta Cacher or the uh, parking garage entry that draw you into the casino and directly to Flutie's Sports Pub. Um, the Flutie Sports Pub entrance is also made with a stone and it contains the Heisman Trophy case on display. Once you get into Flutie's, we have an illuminated bar top that has, um, shows the veining of the natural stone. And um, ledger stone walls form the portals to all the public restrooms. And natural stone is found throughout the entire facility at all the bar tops, cashier counters, and food venues. For wood, um, we use a variety of natural wood species in our cabinetry, millwork, and features throughout the facility. Um, at both the port share entry and the parking garage entry, you walk in and there are this tiger grain wood, very exciting um, grains, ceiling features that step as you walk through and it's flanked with the feature columns made of stone. Um, once you get to Flutie's, after on the side walls where we have uh, display cases that um, contain Doug Flutie's various uniforms that he wore throughout his career, those walls are made with the same tiger grain wood. Um, and um, we also, in between <coughs> the other columns where there isn't a case, there are these video projection TVs that you can view when you're inside the facility or outside the facility. It's very exciting. Um, when you get into Slack's Oyster Bar and Grill, um, we have an elaborate wood facade that, um, with all the doors, windows, and a specialty wine display cases with a floating wood slat ceiling once you enter upon inside. And the Revolution 1776 Entertainment Bar features a wood detailed bar front and a beautiful dark highly grained dance floor. For metals, a variety of metals are used throughout the venues, including the high limit area, which will have a custom designed metal railing. A metal and glass feature wall greets you as you walk into Flutie's. A custom curved metal railing separates the entertainment lounge from the gaming floor. 
and also the food court is encircled with a custom metal railing. And the entry chandeliers that are between the floating wood ceilings are made with metal and glass. Um, our water imagery is found in all of our textiles, our wall coverings, and the pa carpet pattern, which I'm sure you saw when you were there yesterday, yes. and also is in the live racing um, wall coverings. So we use stood, uh, stone, wood, and metal materials throughout our, with our water imagery and the textiles intertwined throughout the facility to complement each other and tie everything together and create a warm and inviting um, experience for the guests. Sounds great. Yeah. Good. Um, remind me, Lance or Ms. Whitmore, what, um, uh, what the origin of the slacks, uh, there's a local reference there. What was that uh, name? I, uh, I, I actually looked on Wikipedia last night to make sure <laughs> I remember this, but I believe yeah. the name is Benjamin Slacks, who was a, uh, a wealthy individual in the town of Plainville, so they referred to Plainville as Slackville. So that's the, the tie-in there. And then they changed the name based on the geography, also from Wikipedia, from uh, based on the plains that are found in, in Plainville. So that's how the name got changed originally. Yeah. And oh, then so it was, it was actually formally called Slackville. Correct. Oh, I didn't Correct. Know that. And oh. then they named it Plainville afterwards. Oh. Yep. Great. Is there gonna be any, uh, any little historic marker or something explaining where that comes from? Yeah, we'll certainly decorate the, the interior appropriately, trying to illustrate the history of, uh, of the town. Yeah, yep. great. That's great. And uh, what was the state mineral? Babbing tonight. Babbing tonight. <laughs> yes. I'll have to look it up in Wikipedia state too. Yeah. I had to look that one up as well. <laughs> Thank you. Commissioners, there's also that's a, great. There's also a separate uh, building that's, that's not attached to this for, that houses the uh, racing office and the licensing <coughs> office as well. And that's not completed yet, but in progress. Yes. Great. And for anybody who doesn't know, June 24th is the target date. Everything's looking good? Yes. Feeling good today. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, thoughts, comments? We have to vote to approve this. Oh, do we have to vote to? No. No? No? We're all set. I think what we want to do is we um, keep in mind that we have regulations about the operation certificate that are going through the formal process. Yep. So I think before we take a formal vote on this, we want to consider some of the findings that have to be made under that regulation. We don't have to wait for it to be final, but um, we want to look at things like defining the gaming area, which I think that regulation requires. So I think it's good to consider this first and then come back with, with that thought in mind. Okay. Great. Great. No, this is very exciting. This yeah. is a, this is a great. I Thank haven't you. yet been down there, but I hope to get down there and look for myself in the near future. So Thank you. Very exciting. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Director Day, before you go ahead, I just meant to mention one thing that came out of the minutes. I, for, I kept forgetting to mention it. Um, the, there were two votes taken, which are recorded in the minutes, uh, that were proposed by uh, Mark Vanderlinden from our Research and Problem and Responsible Gambling. Uh, one was the vote on the Moore contract, which is for the PR communication strategy for GameSense. One was for the evaluation contract of a variety of our responsible uh, gambling tools uh, for Cambridge Health Alliance, and we both, we did vote to approve those, but it was subject to the approval of the Public Health Trust Fund Executive Committee, uh, which is chaired by the Secretary of Health and Human Services and myself, in this case her designee, the Commissioner of the Department of Public Health, and that body did meet last week, mm -hmm. uh, or no, this, this week. week, this week, and did vote to approve both of those two contracts. I just wanted to mention that since it was in the yeah. minutes. Okay, back to Director Day. Uh, commissioners, if you'll take a look at uh, its uh, list, it's under uh, item uh, 3B, just for your reference. Uh, IEB has granted uh, temporary licensing, and this is a process to provide that information to the Commission to keep you up to date on those temporary licenses. To Stephanie Shockley, the Surveillance uh, Manager, Penn National, and Barry Rhodes, the Food and Director Manager. Okay. What I'd like to do, if, if I could, is then uh, have you refer to the next item, which is uh, 
3C, the operations plans update. There's two documents in there. One is a short memorandum. Uh, the other document is what you are used to seeing as well, is the uh, uh, the, the planning chart that we have usually accompanied our activities. So let me just briefly take take you through some of the developments uh, since our last we, we last talked about the operations plan, I believe, on 319. Uh, and what we have done since, of course, is the, our finance office has implemented the budget adjustments, which was a reduction of about 3.8 million. We've discussed with the commission on, that we discussed with the commission on March 19th. Our finance, officer, finance office has also reduced the annual assessment and notified the licensees of, of the assessment uh, due and payable. Uh, our budget for 2015 was, it come out about 25.5 million and includes a $17.5 million repayment to the mitigation fund. In addition, although legislation has passed to allow Suffolk to continue to simulcast, there's still uncertainty regarding the horse racing industry, uh, but we understand we'll be getting additional information here uh, in the near future. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Lightbaum may as well have some comments to share with you. Obviously, uh, as everybody's announced, uh, horse racing at Plain Ridge opened yesterday. And uh, Dr. Lightbaum will be here to talk about a few racing issues as well, and I'm sure she'll have comments on the first day of racing herself. Uh, we continue to monitor the budget expenditures uh, with our horse racing program, and we're prepared uh, in the event that uh, the commission in the future approves additional days of thoroughbred racing, we'll be able to accommodate the regulatory needs. The commission as well, and that's one thing about the, uh, uh, the chart, uh, as you take a look at it, it's usually on page two, um, but what, what you'll see as you go down, this is the whole regulation section. And essentially I can do a lot of this by just exception right in the middle of the chart. I can find it. Uh, right, in the, right in the middle of the chart, I think it's coming up. Let's keep going down a little bit. Right about there, I think. This, uh, this area here, which is called, where'd it go? Give me a quick, oops, back up a little. Gaming equipment. This is the only one that you might see as we, we made that pending because uh, what, what that particular regulation now uh, deals with is something that we can wait until table games. But other than that, as you look down the rest of the chart, uh, the regulations that the commission had start out to adopt before the slot parlor opened, which are licensing and vendors and employees reporting, alcohol beverage control, credit checks, ATM, internal controls, including tax and financial reporting, exclusion <coughs> lists, security procedures for minors, operating certificate and pre-opening inspection, slot machine standards and testing, self-exclusion process, and the hearing process. Uh, all those uh, regulations that the commission has put forward are either in effect or should be in effect according to the normal uh, publication schedules before the slot part or opens on the 24th. Uh, the, uh, what we are also going to be in the process, as the commissioners know, we've developed the regulations, moved them forward and moved through the commission's process, uh, anticipating the, the, op the operation of the slot parlor. Of course, anticipation and actually see how everything functions in the end are two different things. Uh, so we, what we're going to be doing is keeping an eye out of any areas that's, that seem to be bumps in the road relative to the operations and the regulations. We'll take a look at those. Uh, if they factually justify moving forward, we'll be back to the commission uh, to ask for changes if necessary. So I just wanted to make sure the commission was aware we're, we're not going to sit back and let things go forward all by itself. We'll keep an eye on anything that we would recommend needs a change to move forward. In addition, relative to the slot parlor opening, <coughs> the state police are completing selection of their MSP staff uh, for the slot parlor. Uh, we hired 12 gaming agents to provide 24-hour uh, gaming regulatory presence. And we've, got, we've got all 12? Yes, we do. Uh, we, we did have one last-minute withdrawal, which we have since uh, put someone else back in. Okay. Uh, the uh, assistant director, I, I want to point out real briefly, uh, uh, Bruce Band uh, and our, uh, our human resources officer, Troop Devanda, they've definitely worked together in this process, and there's a lot of work gone in to find a great blend of experience and new agents uh, as we start this first venture in, in on-site regulatory experience. So with that group, we're, we've got our gaming uh, agents that we need for, 
for the opening. Yeah, state. Right? I know yeah. state police is very close. They may have already right. made their final right. section. They're very close, and we we have our 12 agents. We're ready to move forward in that aspect. Right. We do have a training scheduled. About four weeks of training scheduled on 511. Uh, they'll cover all kinds of areas, including uh, obviously slot prep or, or slot regulation, right. uh, internal controls, uh, problem gambling as well, or responsible gaming techniques as well. So this will be a, a four week long series of instruction and we hope to, we plan to involve the state, new state troopers, but also uh, our gaming agents uh, and hopefully uh, anyone who may have work at the site uh, from the Attorney General's office or uh, the Alcohol Beverage Control Bureau as well. Great. So the training is starting, uh, did you say May 11th? May 11th, that's correct. Will, um, would it be, let's see, would it be um, reasonable to have, if Bruce, um, come before us on the 30th and give us a pretty good overview. I, I'd really like to know what all is being done in the training, how it's being done. It's really critical uh, part of this process. And, and it, I'd, I'd be interested in having a pretty comprehensive presentation on who's, what, what it's gonna consist of and who's gonna do it and where it comes from and so forth. I, I will uh, check with Bruce, but I will anticipate the 30th and it, we may have to move it out uh, one more commission meeting uh, yeah. to make well, sure that we've that confirmed. The next commission meeting is after it's already started. So you know, and then there may be the any, any one of us that's, might have true. some substantive ideas about it. So uh, we, will, we will get an update to you on the training on the 30th. Okay. And have we, have we uh, uh, reached out to the Attorney General's office to, to uh, solicit their interest in having people attend? It's my understanding we have, yes, right. Commissioner. Great. But you'll double check. And make yes, sure. I will. Okay. Anything else? I have a few questions on the schedule. Was he? Were you um, done with the overview? Uh, no, I had some other items to keep moving forward with. Okay. But I no, can, no, please, okay. please do. Um, in addition, we have approved the surveillance plan uh, submitted by Plain Ridge Park, and our staff is in the process of, of looking at and adding to about 60 internal control sections at this point. Um, our primary gaming manufacturers have, that have applied have been issued temporary licenses to allow purchases, shipment, and installation of electronic devices. Uh, we've received and processed over 200 applications for non-gaming vendors. Licensing and IAB right now are working on about 60 applications for technicians that will actually do the installation work for manufacturers. Um, we, we are working to try to get that accomplished here so that process can begin basically tomorrow. Uh, we've added two licensing specialists to process applications and two temporaries to help with data entry. We're finishing development of the casino alcohol beverage license uh, to bring that back to the commission hopefully in May. Uh, the self-exclusion program uh, program is in place or program regulations are in place and the procedures and forms and our training are in process. I think as the commission has discussed before, the play management with the approval of the play management uh, project requirements uh, with that approval, and we are working with the licensee, uh, the manufacturer, and the evaluation team uh, to develop the system. We've certified two gaming labs and are in the process of selecting a lab to provide testing and on-site inspection service. And I want to have a little correction here. I got a little excited. Uh, we are actually, we haven't developed, we're actually working with Penn uh, to develop a manual tax reporting system uh, to supply that, that requirement until such time as the central management system can come get up and running. Uh, we select an accounting firm to help with the internal controls. Uh, the travel and tourism plan has been approved by the commission presented, and we've uh, identified the recipient for the area small business capacity grant for the Plainville area. That, that's the end of that part of the update. Uh, Commissioner Zunig, if you had some additional items, I could take a run at those too. Uh, you, you said we received and processed 200 applications of non-gaming vendors. Yes, that are, number are is those, actually higher, so I'm approximately 200. But. Are those are all those people licensed? Uh, the total number that have actually made it through license because they're registered. So non-gaming vendors uh, submit their applications. Once their application is complete, uh, then they are registered. Then the, the licensing bureau notifies them of that registration usually. I can't tell you whether or not all those have been licensed or been registered at this point. 
I think the number, the exact number is probably closer to 250 some that have actually come through. Okay. They go over, the commission might recall that they, that once they're moved, they move over to the IAB. Uh, it's an exception testing process uh, because they can, once they're registered, they can actually supply the, the uh, product that, that the licensee needs. Okay. Anything else? Um, I just wanted to check on a couple of dates. Have we um, executed an agreement with the ABCC? We are very close, but haven't quite got the final signature. We had some last minute changes again to that agreement, some recommendations from ABCC, so we're looking at those before we finalize it. And will you be bringing that before us to give us? No, that's an MOU, so we'll just be signing that as we have uh, the other okay. ones. And just tell us. Correct. Because we, we have MOUs with MSP and with the Attorney General's right. office, and, and this is the final right. one in that capacity. Right. Um, you're, you're showing in the schedule that um, there's the licensing database is operational on 624. Uh, the, is that well, still it's, it's actually that would be a fully operational. Um, so what we anticipate that our last agreement with the uh, provider of services NTT will expire at the end of June. So we anticipate that's basically when we'll we'll have it pretty much fully operational. And um, now, our, now there's the difference between that, of course, uh, Commissioner Zuniga, fully operational and user satisfaction is maybe two things right there, a different two things, but we'll continue to work on it. Okay. And you have uh, the play management uh, development um, ending 6-1, that, that date may have to be moved. Um, Further, that uh, that's correct. Uh, basically, last time uh, Director Vanderlyn and I had a chance to do this schedule and work up those proposed dates. Uh, of course, the the hope is still that it would be possible to have that process begin with opening. Uh, uh, Mark uh, and I, I think generally, that's the process would like to see, but also the recognition that that is going to be difficult to make. But he hasn't he hasn't said he's going to slip it yet. Well, there's a recent there, yeah. there, there's a recent question that may require development, and that's right. really in a state of flux right now. Um, has to do with the with free play and the credits on your player card uh, counting towards a a limit or not. Um, but just wondering if that's incorporated here or not. No, that particular problem isn't. Uh, incorporated because when we did that, it, we weren't aware of that. Well, and we don't we don't yet know so, yet whether right. that's going to affect the schedule. And this is uh, the idea, and then the actual development of the software that incorporates it are, are two different things. But the idea is to get it done so it can be available uh, on opening. And lastly, you have a milestone here for June one about processing half that the employee applications of 238. What is the number now? Do you know? The total number processed all the way through through investigations, I do not know, uh, Commissioner Zuniga. Okay. Uh, that uh, we had previously anticipated the, about half the applications on April, about April 1, uh, based on the numbers we had. That's not gonna, going to occur, uh, so we anticipate we should have at least half by the first part of June. Half of half or half of 238? Uh, we should have half of the total. So that the, if the total was going to be about 500, we should be at least up to 250. And by June 31st or by June 1st? By June 1st. Okay. And you're meeting with Penn, right, to do sort of a reset on these numbers and try to get a realistic assessment of what really is going to come in when we, so we can be ready to process whatever it is because, as we talked about, it's going to hit it's going to hit us at some point and we need to try to understand as quickly as we can what that's likely to realistically be. We've been having an ongoing dialogue with Penn uh, from that perspective. Uh, have, uh, they have been uh, very good at filing uh, information with us, giving us estimates of what their license, what they anticipate their employee license application uh, times will be. Uh, and you're correct, we have a, another meeting scheduled with uh, Lance, as a matter of fact, here this Friday, sit down and have a serious discussion about where we're at. All right, okay, good. I'd love an update of that meeting whenever you get a chance. I uh, would be happy to do that. Thank you. 
If there are no other questions, that's what I did have. I on. did have one. I should know the answer to this, I'm sure. But what on page two, the last uh, check mark is uh, a recipient of the Plainville Area Small Business Capacity Building Grant. What what is that? That's the. It's essentially a. Uh, and and uh, I'm sure Commissioner Stebbins will provide some fine tuning if I need it. Uh, but that is a, a grant to provide technical assistance, uh, essentially to help uh, where it's needed to help people build particularly capacities like a, the accounting programs and, and uh, uh, financial monitoring and those kind of things. Oh, I it's buildings. Uh, I got yeah, it. I remember yeah, right. now. It's building, it's building small business capacity. Correct. It's right. uh, right. $20,000 right. set aside, right. and hopefully uh, we, we've, uh, we had right. a, uh, uh, an applicant to the grant program. They are kind of finalizing what their program is going to look like, and hopefully I would expect Jill would bring that back in front of us. Right, right. Oh, I remember that discussion. Now I thought it was a physical building. I misread it. I did have as well, uh, and a, uh, um, a couple non-slot partner uh, items that I thought was worthwhile mentioning uh, as well. And plus, I also promised uh, Director Griffin that I would I would announce this as well. And I think the commissioners know, but it's it's important uh, schedule is the Access and Opportunity Committee did have its first meeting, and uh, was quite well attended from our perspective. And uh, we have Director Griffin and Ron Marlowe have been invited to give a report to the commission at the May 14th meeting on the progress of that committee. We are also continuing to recruit for two staff attorney positions, a licensing director and a gaming lab manager as we move through the end of this fiscal year. With that, that's we the end unless there are other reach questions. Reach out to Mars to try to find a gaming lab uh, manager. <laughs> broaden our search a little. Well, oh, we, we have we have requested professional help. So okay. we've issued that RFR and, and we're are going to get some professional help to try to locate that particular person. Right. We've also talked and probably will, uh, uh, Chairman Crosby, we'll, we're going to also look at uh, moving forward with a recruitment of an engineer position or a slot tech, depending on which part of the industry you're from, uh, to provide that technical, technical inter that technical expertise uh, to our uh, IT unit until such time as we do have the gambling lab manager on board. Okay, great. Sounds, Sounds good. Seeing, seeing yep. no other questions, Sounds thank you very much. Nope. A lot of detail, a lot of moving parts. Succinctly presented. Thank you. Thank you. We go to um, legal division, Attorney General, I mean, General Counsel Blue. Yeah, Attorney General. Um, I have one question before you um, kick off, um, and which will work out just about fine timing. I got an email from a um, selectman, uh, the mo town moderator, I think, in Plainville. Did you see that? I did, yes. Okay. And he said he understands that we're considering a reg which would prohibit elected officials in host communities from, particip from going to the casinos in, the, in their uh, facility for the facilities in their communities. Uh, I don't think we are considering that, are we? Or where, it, it is in one of our regs, I, I believe, internal control. There is a, there is a portion in one of our regs that um, talks about local municipal officials and whether they can attend the casino in their, their community. But, but the reg says placing a wager I in think, the casino. Yes. It yeah. does not preclude anybody from attending and going to the restaurant or whatever. Whatever yeah, it, I believe it just addressed wagering, but it oh, is in does, a rig that right. we've had he, there. He says this, so from engaging in gaming at the facility mm -hmm. in their town. Um, and we've discussed this a couple of times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, right. Most recently, the, the internal controls, yeah. uh, whatever version it was. <laughs> and, and we, it's funny, I, can't rem I, I thought maybe we were something else we were talking about. I, I thought I remembered that we thought that was not our role. It was it was a, a local role, but we have we have adopted or we are adopting. That's in the that's in the current reg. Uh, right. You know, if we adopted them today, uh, that's in the internal controls. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, we, we, do you want to expand on that, uh, Council or well, attorney? Let me uh, let me read the attorney. email because I think it's I'm uh, forgive me if, if this has been thoroughly hashed out before, but have, have you all read the email? Yeah. yeah. Oh, have you seen it, Jim? Uh, I don't think I've seen it. Okay, well, let me just read it. Um, uh, this is from the moderator. I'd like to express my strong opposition to such a rule. This is uh, uh, prohibit elected officials in any host municipality 
from, in gaming, from engaging in gaming at the facility in their town. While I'm not a regular gambler by any means, I resent the implication of such a rule. If I am to understand this rule, I cannot be trusted to exercise my oath as an elected official while enjoying myself from time to time at a casino. I'm sure that there are already laws and rules which sufficiently monitor the behavior of elected officials and Plain Ridge when it comes to contributions or gratuities if this is the concern being addressed. Such a rule is overreaching and seems to smack of a violation of constitutional rights as a citizen. At the very least, if implemented, this rule will cause future nominees for elected office to give pause as to whether they want to give up their freedoms in order to serve in these voluntary positions. To follow your logic for this rule, I would suggest that the ABCC also prohibit elected officials from purchasing alcohol in their towns where licenses are issued by the town. Where does it stop? Most all of the elected officials in Plainville have had no involvement in the licensing and agreements with Plain Ridge. I don't see how a park commissioner or a library trustee who are elected officials mm -hmm. in Plainville has any impact on the goings on at Plain Ridge. I would suggest that state officials have had more involvement in the licensing of Plain Ridge, and so if such a rule is implemented, it should also constrain state officials and elected officials from abutting towns who also benefit from Plainville, Plain Ridge. I'm strongly opposed to such a rule. Welcome your comments. Luke P. Travis Esquire, town moderator, I believe. Um, in, sorry, this is Fall River. No moder moderator, okay. He's the moderator, all right, he lives in Fall River, but he's the moderator in, uh, Plainville, right? No. I think that's that his office be. address. Uh, his office is in Fall Oh, his office is in Fall River. I'm Plainville. sorry. Okay. Yeah. So he is the moderator and elected town moderator in Plainville. Sorry. Okay. So, I um, mean, what do you think? I mean, is that, um, does it cause anybody to rethink? Is that in, is that in the, uh, the set of regulations that were to approve today? I don't remember reading it. Um, I can clarify that point for you. Right. That uh, provision is actually in the uh, list of excluded persons regulations, uh, not in the internal controls. Okay. It came Thank up you. at your last meeting uh, where we were you were deciding whether to keep it in there for public comment purposes. Right. And uh, my recollection is that you uh, decided to keep it in, right. let people comment on it. The chair, if my memory serves, did comment that that may be better uh, left to the municipalities right. to make that judgment for themselves. Um, that Those set of regulations are going out for public comment shortly. We're scheduling a public hearing, which should be held within the next month or so. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can make a judgment as to whether to keep that right. provision okay. or remove right. it. Right. But this, I would just consider our first public okay. comment on the issue. All right, thank right. you, Todd. That's very right. helpful. Um, John has left, uh, Rick, but would you mind making sure to, that he sends out to his contacts, because he's got all the surrounding and host community contacts, an, a heads up so that they do think about this? I'd be really interested in hearing other feedback from people before we make a final decision. Okay. Now. Thank you. Sorry if that was slightly out of tune, but the timing is perfect. So good morning, commissioners. I have one item to um, brief you on under my general update this morning. I've been discussing the management of the Revere Boston and Somerville litigation with Chairman Crosby and Commissioner McHugh, as well as with the Attorney General's office. Um, and I've also been discussing with the Attorney General's office their prosecution of criminal matters that are arising out of the sale of the land for the proposed gaming establishment in Everett. As a, re as a result of these discussions and pursuant to the chairman's authority under Chapter 23K, we have mutually agreed with the Attorney General's office that the best way to handle the Revere, Somerville, and Boston litigation, while the criminal litigation is ongoing, is for the commission to secure private counsel to represent the commission in that litigation. The Attorney General's office will then devote its time to the criminal prosecution we agree that if the Attorney General were to both prosecute the criminal case and to represent the commission in the Revere, Somerville, and Boston litigation, it may complicate the full and vigorous pre presentation of legal issues by both the Attorney General's office and the commission's counsel. We're in the process of drafting the necessary paperwork to appoint Anderson and Krieger as special attorney generals to represent the commission. I expect that that paperwork will be completed either later today or early tomorrow. Uh, we will also issue a joint statement, the Attorney General's Office and the Commission, regarding this matter. I would like to that'll thank... Be, that'll be available later on. Later on. Here, yeah. Yep, that's right. 
Um, I would also like to thank the Attorney General's Office for their very thoughtful um, help in this matter and the cooperation that they've shown us and that we look forward to working with them on all the other matters that pertain to expanded gaming in the Commonwealth. Thank you. So if there are any questions. No, we have a, uh, I have no questions. I, we have a terrific relationship with the Attorney General and, and had with the prior administration, we have a terrific relationship now and this is a way to deal with um, these uh, uh, litigations that are proceeding in parallel and uh, assure that both the civil litigation and the criminal litigation, which uh, started as a result of our investigation and the IEB materials and the materials we forwarded to the Attorney General's office, and then they did their usual fine job of following up, uh, assuring that both of those proceed um, uh, vigorously and uh, avoid um, either um, either uh, the lawyers involved in either uh, of those from tripping over each other or having to worry about the impact of what they're doing in one case on, on how the other proceeds. So uh, this, is a, this is an accommodation for an unusual situation. It's rare that you have a situation like this. Um, and I think it serves uh, the interests of both uh, well. Okay. Well, it's good, it's good to hear, obviously, these, these matters can get complex and there's a lot of nuances, but it sounds like the parties agree that this is a great a way to move forward on the major goals, so it's good to hear. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, next, in your packet, you have small business impact statements. We have five of them for the regulations pertaining to our hearing process sale and distribution of alcoholic beverages, protection of minors, um, the operation certificate requirements, and the exclusion list that Mr. Grossman just referred to. What we're asking the commission to do today is just approve those small business impact statements. This begins, or continues actually, the formal process for promulgation. We anticipate there'll be a public hearing on these regulations probably the third week in May. We're working to put them together and do the necessary advertising. We gotta take this one at a time? Um, I think you can take them all together. You'll notice they have a slightly different format. Uh, we think that this is a much clearer format and addresses the issues that are raised by the Secretary of the State's office um, in terms of small business impact statements. But they are very much, they address some of the same issues for each one. So I think we could approve them all together. Okay. Um, and these are just the five under item B, right? That's correct. Right. Okay. Yes. Uh, Mr. Evans. Chair, I would ask that the Commission approve uh, the small business impact statements for 205 CMR 101 hearings, 205 CMR 136 sale and distribution of alcoholic beverages at gaming establishments, 205 CMR 150 protection of minors and underage youth, 205 CMR 151 requirement for the operations and conduct of gaming, and 205 CMR 152 exclusion list. Second. Second. Any further discussion? So this has nothing to do with the fact that we're going to have an opportunity to think about the substance of these regs again. Um, this is just the, the SBIS. This is Correct. just the beginning. We'll be putting them out for comments, and right. we have other opportunities to review them and revise them as needed. Great. Yeah, all, all, these, uh, all these regulations put a lot of impact on our licensees, but they don't qualify as a small business, so. Mm -hmm. That's Obviously, right. Um, I'll go on. Right. No other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Thank you. Next on our list is the internal controls regulation. Um, this is for final approval. This has been through hearing and through comment and through revisions. So I'll let Mr. Grossman address this and um, hopefully we can move these to promulgation stage. Good morning. Uh, you'll recall at your last meeting, we went through the uh, internal control draft. Before you today uh, is a draft that includes a number of uh, additions and adjustments based upon your comments. Um, they are in green in the draft. And I'm certainly prepared to go through them individually with you if you'd like. Otherwise, uh, there's really only one specific comment that I wanted to make. Uh, about. Can I just ask about colors? Uh, uh, there's green and there's red. Are the red the same red that were in the last draft yes. we looked at? And then there's strikeouts in here. Are those the strikeouts that were in the last 
yes. draft as well. The only thing that's different is the green. Is language. the green. Okay. <coughs> Tell me, though, uh, before then you get into it, uh, why did we, and, and I, this is another thing I should know the answer to, uh, why did we take out the um, uh, provision dealing with floor plans in here? We moved it to, to the operations certificate okay. section. Right, right. Okay. That's right. Got it. Thanks. Okay, That's, that was my only preliminary question. The, um, so you, you'll see we included that variance provision that was discussed for temporary variances. That's on page 10. Um, that would allow uh, more of an on the floor decision to be made by the IEB as to whether to grant a, a temporary and limited variance. So this is the language we came up with for that. Okay. Uh, did you want to go into more detail about that? We, we, in the last version of this, if my memory serves me, we excluded um, the availability of a variance and the variance process from certain regulations dealing with credit. That's right. And we've eliminated that exclusion now. No. Or have we, have, we, no. have we kept it in effect by the limited scope of permissible variances in the first sentence? I, we've kept it. There are two separate variance provisions now, and they're both on the same page, uh, page 10. The first one is up above. It's in red. We didn't touch that at all. This is the language that was before you last week, and you'll see that, uh, to your point, uh, Commissioner McHugh, the last sentence in paragraph 6 uh, precludes the applicant or the licensee from seeking a variance from the credit provisions. And that is from a broad permanent uh, variance uh, from the internal control uh, provisions. The green language is different. Uh, that's for a temporary limited variance, and we limit it to uh, uh, internal control issues dealing with the gaming operations. Yeah, this, so, is, this is to prevent that 3 o'clock Phone call, 3 to deal with issues call. like that. Yeah, that, uh, that was brought up by our consultants last time, which I think is very reasonable, 48 hours. Comments, questions, anything else? Is there anything else you well, want? Well, there is one other. Okay, go ahead. After. Sorry. Did you have that one? I, I, I No, I, I, I guess it's all right. I, I, I had trouble reconciling uh, 6 with 7B. Um, maybe it's clear and I just need to reread it, but, I, but I, I, I did have trouble reconciling the two. Um, so why don't you go ahead? Well, and just to, maybe it's, it's clear only in my head. No, no, it's probably clear to everybody but me. Uh, 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 six deals with the, the internal control submissions, the whole um, soup to nuts submission by the casinos that deal with everything. And we say as part of those submissions and any amendments that have to be made to the permanent internal control filings, that they can request variances from certain provisions if they're able to show that what they're requesting will essentially achieve the same or similar outcome. Provided that in no instance can they request a variance from the credit regulations. That has to be what it is. What we say it is is what it has to be. What 7B is designed to do is to allow our IEB staff uh, through the director uh, a chance to make uh, or to, to allow a variance from those approved internal controls for a temporary period of time to address an on-site issue. Mm -hmm. That's why they were put in separate sections, because I think they're different issues. Yeah. Well, why are they, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm so obtuse, why are they different issues? It seems to me that what's in 7B is a subset of what's in 6. I, I think that's that's a fair comment. Sure, uh, but but 
but how is it how 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 is it a subset that excludes uh, the credit regulations? It doesn't say it excludes the credit regulations. It does not say that. It all it says is that it has to be it has to relate to the gaming operation. Well. And the gaming operations don't include the extension of credit. Is is that is that clear? Uh, maybe it is not as clear. It was clear to me, but right. maybe it's not clear. I just wonder if we couldn't if we couldn't either buy a, a, a subject to or except for um, connection between those two. Uh, let. Um, people like me, I guess, uh, understand that they do go together and make sure that the flow and the connection and the limitations are the same. Or that, for example, um, uh, the credit regulations are not uh, still in 7B, still not subject to uh, the variance procedure. So I, I guess there are two options. Um, one would be just to do that, to specifically exclude the credit regulations from the temporary limited variance, and that might be the best way to do it. The other, which we looked at, was just putting this whole paragraph in section six above, um, so it piggybacks off of that. The reason it's in seven is because seven talks about the casinos abiding by their system of internal control, so this is an exception from that. Um, but, but to yeah. your point, I think perhaps we just add uh, a sentence saying you can't get a temporary uh, variance from the credit ranks, if that's the concern. Uh, ideally, uh, it, it, I, I would favor putting it in, in uh, six and having a reference in, in um, an internal reference saying that this is a subset of provisions and it doesn't conflict with and it's a tying the two more closely together so that the reader doesn't and I, I'm sorry I should have discussed this with you earlier but I didn't get around to looking at these regs until late. Commissioner McHugh are you saying just, just include um, 7B in 6? Yes and, and have have some something that says notwithstanding 7A, uh, notwithstanding 6A, which will now be 6A, a temporary uh, variance under the following conditions from other than credit regs can be given. That's not the exact language, but. So basically, basically just put it in, in 6 and have the same restriction. Yeah. An intelligible transition. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right, you got something else? Uh, the, yeah, um, this is on page 48. This deals with the FinCEN uh, AML filings. <coughs> You'll recall uh, we discussed at your last meeting uh, a, adding language that would require uh, the casinos to abide by uh, the Bank Secrecy Act and uh, develop anti-money laundering processes and protocols. So, and you had also requested that we put language in requiring that the casinos uh, submit to the commission or the IEB a copy of all uh, currency transaction reports and suspicious activity reports uh, concurrent with their filing with FinCEN. Um, and that is what this language reflects here. This was something the Attorney General had requested. In broad terms, that's that's correct. Um, I contacted FinCEN just to gain a better understanding of how the process works, um, having after looking at their regulations, and um, I spoke to a number of people there, including one of the members of their legal staff, uh, about the process. As you you see, if you read through the FinCEN regulations, and there's a specific section that we reference here that deals specifically with casinos. Um, suspicious activity reports in particular are highly confidential uh, documents and the filing of them in and of the, itself is generally confidential. 
And so there was some question as to whether it is the uh, best uh, course to require the casinos to send us a copy, and it would have to be a hard copy most likely, of each of these reports as they're filing them with FinCEN. Now FinCEN has a portal that the casinos go into and file these reports uh, with them, and then they maintain a hard copy as I understand the process. So we would essentially be getting a hard copy. And a number of jurisdictions do this, so it's not unheard of. And it's not impermissible under the uh, FinCEN regulations. But what they told me is that the preferred process for a commission like ours would not be to require a contemporaneous filing of the reports, but instead for us to request from them and go through their process uh, to gain access to their database so that we could search for whatever we want when you want it, instead of having all the reports sent to you uh, as a matter of course. Um, that helps uh, ensure the confidentiality and use concerns that go along with these reports. Um, and there, there are certain liability issues that attach to that as well uh, in the event that they're inadvertently disclosed uh, for any uh, reason. So it seems to me at the moment that uh, the commission should consider uh, striking the last uh, part here of this paragraph and instead allowing us to pursue uh, an application with FinCEN so that the IEB, and D, we can do it on behalf of the AG or in conjunction with the AG's office as well, uh, gain access to the FinCEN database. As I understand it, the Mass State Police already have that access, so it's, it's fairly common. Um, whether we could get access immediately is uh, somewhat unclear. It sounds as though uh, they like to see you demonstrate a need first. Um, and there are provisions in the regulations that address uh, requesting individual reports from FinCEN. Um, so it might be a, a process that has to uh, occur over time, but in any event, it's one that they recommended we pursue. Um, and so with that, I would recommend that at least at the moment that we pursue that course and maybe revisit the issue if it becomes necessary. So my recommendation here is that we, end, we cut off uh, paragraph 12 after the word card clubs, which is uh, four lines down. So it would basically just require the gaming licensees to have in place procedures to ensure compliance with uh, the Bank Secrecy Act and FinCEN regulations, period. Does our IEB uh, state, do our IEB uh, troopers have access to this as part of the state police? Do we know? Uh, I believe they do. They have used it in suitability investigations. They have, okay. Mm -hmm. I am perfectly fine with that recommendation. I'll go along with that. My only concern about it is just that this was one that, that the Attorney General had been interested in. And if, if you had a chance to touch base with his, her, staff on this discussion? Uh, we sent this to them uh, on Monday. Sent this? The, the language. Yeah, well, um, which we're now proposing to change. Well, I mean, I believe her comment was just that we should have procedures in place to ensure compliance with anti-money laundering um, uh, concerns, and this would still do that. Uh, whether we receive the reports or not, uh, that's an additional tool that would be helpful, and we're not uh, precluding the ability for us or them to get the reports. Right. You just have to follow to the FinCEN regulations. I, I'm, I'm very much in favor of this uh, course uh, and um, with um, working with the Attorney General's office to make sure that they uh, get it as well and notifying of, of what you've found out. And then if we can't get it and still want it, um, to come back and amend this regulation uh, moving forward. It seems to me that having a book of papers lying around with these are sp sus somebody's suspicion about somebody's activity. And it seems to me that kind of information ought to be closely uh, monitored and re restrained. So um, uh, unless there's a significant reason to get it. so. I think this is an appropriate course, and I think that's not inconsistent with the Attorney General's request that she, uh, that their office have uh, access to this information as well. 
I'm totally fine with that. I just think you ought to, you ought to give Benny a call. We, what we've done is send them this and say that we were going to be adopting this today, and we aren't, and we just need to give them a heads up quickly and explain why. And commissioners, I think, I think the uh, added provision that, that if uh, the access doesn't materialize in a, any kind of regular and consistent basis that, that we can come back and revisit this is right. important. Because my personal experience, I know it's not always been the fastest process that uh, oh, really? if you're trying to investigate something, the information is not always available in the, the time that you want it. So it'll be interesting to see how this moves forward. Okay. Great. Uh, there was just one last thing. I'm sorry. Yep. Uh, we did receive some uh, last-minute comments from MGM on these um, uh, internal controls as a whole, and the only, I, I, by and large, I think they're fair comments. I don't know if anyone, if you've had a chance to see them. Is uh, it in the book? I didn't it's see not it. in the it's, book. I don't, I don't see, think I've ever seen that. Um, I don't remember it. I, I reviewed them with Bruce Band, um, and it was our opinion that by and large all of the comments would be things that would be subject, uh, proper uh, subjects for variance requests in their in the MGM filings if if that's the, the way they want to uh, pursue things. There was one issue though that they raised that I thought, uh, we thought would uh, warrant some clarification. And that is we, uh, we use the term pi gal when we refer to uh, minimum personnel in section 138.11 and they suggested and we agreed that we should clarify that what we mean by that is pi gal uh, tiles and not pi gal poker. But other than that, if, if there's no objection, we could make that clarification. Nobody objects. Nope. <laughs> Can I come back to the, the, the previous statement, though, that the things that they're talking about now would be appropriate uh, for a variance request? Did you see the letter? I didn't. No, I don't think any of us has seen this letter. What? what? I, I'm a little concerned, without having seen the letter, um, about setting up an environment from the get-go that has a general set of regulations and then uh, go ahead and ask for variances. Uh, I thought that the, the variance concept was sort of an emergency concept or a, uh, we're going to do things uh, uh, slightly differently um, uh, the, uh, in any event, it wasn't. It was not going to be a regulatory device. It was going to be an exception to a regulatory device, basically. And we only have. We're only going to have at most four licensees. And and if we have a set of regulations and four sets of variances from them from the get go, uh, is that is that a good way to proceed? Rather than tackling head on the how, how can we discuss this without knowing what the letter says? I mean, we, we don't have any idea what. No, I know. Why I don't know. we? I'm, well, it I'm, seems to me this is important enough. We ought to get the either if, if Jed wrote it, Ned can Jed can come up and tell us what's in it, or we ought to get it. I I have no sense of what we're talking about, so I, I don't know how to react to the either your suggestion or your reaction to the suggestion. Mm -hmm. Ned, Jed, might as well. I think yeah. So why ever. Wherever the letter got lost in the shuffle, somebody should figure that out because we should have seen this letter. But since Jed's here, let's. I can look at my notes too. Well, I think it's a, an interesting discussion around the, I guess, the role of variances. I don't know if we necessarily want to get into this. Um, we had pointed out um, a, a few. Um, uh, aspects of the internal control regulations that didn't match up with current MGM Resorts International um, uh, essentially um, uh, practices, especially around um, the uh, issue of um, <clears throat> what the uh, Compliance Committee uh, does and doesn't do, um, in particular around um, uh, review of matters not involving uh, essentially uh, gifts to uh, domestic political officials, but issues around um, whether or not there are potential review of issues on uh, the um, uh, Foreign uh, Corrupt Practices Act. Uh, we have a slightly different process for doing that. It doesn't involve the Compliance Committee, but rather the General Counsel's Office. 
So there were just some technical aspects to the regulations, and I just used that one as an example that um, you know, we certainly want to be able to preserve that have worked well, that have ensured, and I think what the variance language uh, anticipates is that we're achieving the same result uh, or that we're, um, uh, we have something that is uh, you know, basically substantially similar. So these were some of the things we wanted to bring to the Commission's attention, if you will consider them as uh, particular uh, amendments um, to the regulations. That's one way to go, um, certainly discussing them in the context of a uh, variance type uh, filing I think is is appropriate. I think there are going to be times where um, we're going to look to the internal controls and need to make some adjustments that again achieve the results we're attempting to do but may do it in a slightly different way. Frankly, uh, f uh, as I hear you, I, I would like to look at the letter of, sure. because as I hear you, uh, variances from um, things designed to deal with the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and, and domestic political uh, contributions are not the kinds of things I would think that the Commission would, at least from my standpoint, want to delegate to the sure. executive director to make judgments about. I, I and, think, I, and, and, and in addition to that, what your practices, what MGM's practices are, may uh, spark thinking about best practices. and certainly. and and help us change the regs. So anyway, that's, that's my initial yeah. reaction yeah. to this. So the variance mechanism that you're taught, you had suggested this come under, this is one where we have delegated to the executive director the discretion to decide which variance he might grant on his own and then mm -hmm. tell us about, or decide it's too important and he would bring it to us. Right. But there's, there's also an element of um, there, there, there's two, two phases in all of these, as I understand them broadly, the internal controls. There will be a submission of the, of the plan that the director approves, and then there will be an ongoing um, you know, monitoring, I guess, adherence. It's like an audit program and then conducting the audit program. And, and I think it's, it's an element that you know, maybe was gets a little bit lost in the shuffle when we're talking about exceptions. Um, so let me just be clear on this. So what you're saying is MGM will submit a set of internal controls yes, to us, right. which, will, which we will have required match yes, our standards. Which we in will their review. App, in their submission, yes. they will say, we would like you to waive A, B, and C, because although we do this, we do it in a different way. Not and necessarily. It, they it, will say, here's how we propose to meet all of your uh, requirements and check to see whether, you know, and we'll review them. In fact, one of the, um, one of the updates that Director Day was giving us is we have uh, Aid Bailey, an accounting uh, firm, just doing just that for PEN. And then there will be a ongoing right. implementation and adherence to the internal controls, out of which there may be an instance that something has changed and we would, uh, or, or, or something has come up and, uh, and we need an exception. Yeah. And just to, to put the discussion in context, um, when we uh, discuss sort of the overall approach to the regulations and going for um, a sets of regulations, especially around internal controls and others that are very detailed, um, that have very specific requirements, um, there may be instances, again, where there is something uh, that comes up that we'd like to propose to do in a different way, but that is the equivalent or achieves the same result. Um, I think, and, I, and we put at the beginning of this letter, we recognize, especially when it comes to the internal controls for exactly what uh, Commissioner Zuniga said, this isn't something that's static, that's just going to be based on the regulations. We will come to you with a plan, um, and that plan will have to be approved. Um, and, uh, and if it uh, has uh, something in it that we want to uh, do a slightly different way, that's something that's going to have to be approved as part of that uh, initial process. So this, as a practical matter, this particular example, at least, would not be one where you'd be going to the executive director for a waiver at some point, in the, maybe at some point in the future. This would be something you'd be asking for when you submit your internal controls plan, that which would come before us. Which no, is but but the, that's not what the regulation says, as I read it. It says, if a gaming licensee desires to incorporate a provision in its internal controls that is not in conformity with yada, 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 which is our internal control regulations, it may petition to do so by including a proposal in its internal controls filing, along with a citation to the applicable provision. 
and a written explanation. The executive director may allow the variance upon a finding. It's permissive well, we, with the executive director. Well, how, how would that work? And this is, this well, is in not. This, in this case, we, we'll, we we'll use this example. What one of the things they raised was that um, typically, there, as I understand it, their general counsel will do a certain review that we have said their the audit committee should do. And so, in the is that right? And so. In their internal control filing, they would submit the policies and protocols for the audit committee. This is their initial filing. With, the, yeah, with, the, with the that executive. We have, okay, that's right. Before the, anything has started, before we've before approved anything. their internal controls. Right, right. Okay. before anything. The filing comes in. <clears throat> we say your audit committee has to do X, Y, and Z. They're saying our audit committee is going to do X and Y, and our general counsel is going to do Z. They're not saying Z doesn't get done. Right. They're just saying the general counsel is going to do it, and here's why. It then it would go to the executive director, who would either make a finding that it will achieve the same result, and I'm going to allow that, or not, and I'm going to disallow it. Or the third alternative would be to say that this really needs to go before the commission. Um, I can't make this decision. Let, let me just clarify that. The whole package has to come before the commission. No. Well, no. eventually. No. Uh, no, 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 no. Not the way that it's correct what Commissioner McHugh is saying. It doesn't. But I, okay, I, I, I don't know exactly how that, I thought that before operations begin, there is a threshold separate. step, which is that their system of internal controls has to be presented to us, to the commission, nope. for approval. No. no. That's incorrect. Okay. Yep. So we never approve their internal control system. Nope. No. Okay. All right. It's an administrative process. Okay. okay. So that's and, and, what we're, we're talking about right. here. And if so, you pick up, if you, just to take that example, because that's a good example. So, so I don't, if, if, if it makes sense, if it, if it, these are highly prescriptive, right, which, which, which is fine. This, that's what yeah. they're designed to do. But, but if the prescription it could be fine-tuned by adding or general counsel to the, the, the uh, process, then we have a commission determination about an important uh, element of this. I, I, I come back to the idea that in certain areas, it seems to me we ought not be delegating to the, to the executive director. And if we can correct things and make them better and more flexible and still achieve the same result at this point uh, before they're promulgated, that's the preferable route as far as I'm concerned and reserve these exceptions and variances that the executive director ultimately has the decision either to make or to send on to us, it's still uh, the locus of discretion is in the executive director, not us, that we ought to uh, uh, reserve that for uh, minor things. I, w I completely agree with that, and ordinarily I would have suggested that we take a step back and look at all these issues very carefully. The only reason I su suggested that the variance uh, route would be appropriate here is I know we wanted to get these internal controls approved today so we could get them in place. Right. And we haven't really had a chance to sit down and really uh, go through these proposals and, and discuss. I have talked about them briefly with uh, Mr. Band, but we didn't really go through it as thoroughly as ordinarily we would. So I wasn't prepared to sit before you today and right. make a recommendation one way right. or the other, having you know thought through everything carefully, which is the reason <clears throat> I just suggested they could be dealt with. But that being said, I completely agree that the better course would be to uh, address these issues head on. But what are the consequences? Now remind me of what the consequences are if we don't adopt these today. It's just a timing issue. No, no, I know that, but I mean, what, what, what turns on the timing? What, what, what is the next Pen, two weeks? Pen's operations. It's Pen's Pardon? internal controls. Pen. Right. But Pen's, we've, we've talked about this last week too, because we had this, I think we had the same discussion in our last meeting. And as a practical matter, the, 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 we have our internal control regs. You know, we're talking about some very, very minor tweaks. So I don't, I mean, Penn, Penn knows how to operate to, to, to the vast majority of, or knows what the requirements will be of their internal control system. So maybe we should ask Penn, you know, will it, will it, if we were to leave this open so we could explore what MGM has raised uh, and not address these, this, 
these final issues until the 30th, um, does that uh, materially impede your ability to do what you need to do in time? Yeah, please, Lance. So that sounds like we could um, wait and let you take a look take a look at this and maybe check with the other folks too if they, they might have their same list of stuff I, I don't know was your list Jed exhaustive or was this it, just examples of the it kinds was, of it was it was not yeah Chairman. that's it was actually it's fairly targeted um, there were essentially three issues it was really recognizing some uh, flexibility for um, of the uh, audit committee not to actually perform every function that's listed right. under its enumerated. But by exhaustive, I meant had, had you identified <laughs> what you thought all the, all the areas problems sure. were going to be, sure. or did you just give us three examples and you thought there might no, be? No, this was the, we, we uh, okay. you know, we certainly have ongoing Stuff. concerns regarding some things. We, we pulled out what we thought was important, what we wanted to bring okay. to the commission's attention before you voted. Okay. So would be all right. <laughs> Wait. Sorry, yes, Commissioner, there's one one thing to keep, keep in mind, though, and, and I understand what uh, Penn is saying is, is by the delay, the regs wouldn't be effective until after the opening, just for the practical basis. Well, I think we've talked about that. That's something that everybody can accommodate, but but I want to make sure you know, effective for the because the, the emergency regs the, if we need. This, this is the end. Well, this it? is this is the end. So once you approve it. These have already been through a hearing. Right. So once you approve it, we would file it. They would be effective upon publication. So it's a couple weeks. It, you know, it may, it would be close. It would be fairly well, close, the May, I think. The, the, the May would be April 30th. Should be able to, yeah. There'd be two months before opening. Mm -hmm. June 24th is opening. That's true. Yep. We could always approve by emergency, couldn't we? We, we could do that. The Secretary of State's office um, like is uncomfortable when we do that having gone through the process. So mm. they would you know, prefer we finish the process and then file. But if it's two weeks, we, still, we have a month slip time. You're correct. We should, we should still be able to make that day because this is final approval. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You'd need an automatic variance that says they have to submit it 60 days in advance. Right. So you kind of <laughs> you build in all kinds of right. other yes. things, but right. we can deal with that. Okay. Yeah, I I prefer that. I think we'd all me, feel a me too, bit and I'd love to see that read that letter and understand, you know, those those points. Right. Okay. Anything else? That's all. Thank That's you, it. Councilor Nozel. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Let's take a brief break before we get to our last item, which I think will be racing. So we're not. We won't do our lunch break. Just and a we'll, break. we'll just finish up. I don't right. think we'll do a lunch break. No. All right. Bizarre. We are ready to reconvene um, public meeting number 149, and we have one topic left, which is Ration Division, Dr. Lightbaum. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, first of all, I'll start off with Plainridge. We had their opening day yesterday, and Commissioner Zuniga came out and um, watched the staff in action with the Racing Division and got a tour of the new plant. Um, he also attended the pre-race meeting that we have with the horsemen at the beginning of the year, the racing officials, management, our judges, myself all met with the horsemen and went over a few different things that had changed this year and things that we were looking for. So that was nice to have him at that meeting. Alex, let me uh, mention something. Mm -hmm. um, just congratulations on, um, on, on the start. There's, there's a big um, work, there's a lot of work that happens behind the scenes mm -hmm. and you know the, the, the people at uh, Penn deservedly get a lot of um, Congratulations, but our employees uh, with, with the leadership of Alex, um, you know, have done a great job in uh, just, just the look, the feel, and, and the professionalism that is, that is evident in, in everything that you're doing uh, as, uh, was, was very evident uh, yesterday to me, and, uh, and it was uh, really, really good to see. No, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we had a great day yesterday. They had nine races. Um, six of those uh, had eight horses in, so the fields were good. We've got another eight races that they're going to be racing today, so that's good. Um, the track surface uh, was in good shape. We didn't have any complaints about that. Um, a couple of things that we've added this year with the licensing is um, we can accept credit cards this year, and we're doing multi-year licenses, and both those features have been well received by the licensees. Um, we've done about a little over 400 licenses in the past uh, month, so we're 
getting a lot of people in, which is good. Um, one of the big upgrades that they've done um, since uh, Penn came in is uh, all new um, AV equipment for the judges stand. So we've got high definition TVs, a whole new system that they really like. It enables them to uh, do a lot more up there. So that's been a great tool for our judges to have. Um, we had a number of things with um, the construction going on and all there. It was almost like a reopening of racing. So there were a number of issues that we were going over with Penn and they were very cooperative about getting the different things on our punch list done in time for racing to start. So I really appreciate that. Um, if there's nothing else, I'll go on to the uh, LASIX work group that we had. Yep. So the uh, LASIX work group met three times and in between those times we all did various research. Um, members of that group included the t a veterinarian from each track uh, that administered the LASIX, a member of each horseman's association, um, one of our judges, one of our stewards, uh, legal counsel for the gaming commission, myself and Steve O'Toole from Plain Ridge. Um, one of the things, uh, we finally came to some agreements. One of them was that we felt that having the private vets administer the LASIX again this year made sense economically. Um, we all agreed that we felt the judges should have some leeway as to the timing. We felt that scratches were detrimental to racing and to the horse uh, owners and all. Um, and we also felt that if we did decide to grant some leeway to the program that it should be the exception rather than the rule. We wanted to maintain the four hour rule. So basically the uh, recommendation we came up with was to uh, stay with the four hour rule but if a horse showed up within 15 minutes of that uh, leeway we would allow them to get the Lasix and race, uh, they would automatically be fined. And then after that, if they got um, beyond the three hours and 45 minutes before post, then they would be scratched. So we went ahead and incorporated that into our uh, standard operating procedures and um, you know, put the letter into the Gaming Commission with that recommendation. What, what, uh, what um, practical difference does the 15 minutes make? Um, we found- Why, why you know, I, 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 put another way, how often would somebody who missed the four hour deadline benefit from the 15 minute uh, variance permission? We found that most of the ones that were late last year were within that 15 minute time period. I see. <clears throat> and what this does is uh, once the four hour uh, limit is reached, then we know that those people are late and efforts can be made to contact them and find out, you know, did they just forget or, you know, were they held up and try to get them in before the 15 minutes is up. I see. Okay. And I, when, I, when I, sorry, go ahead. No, I, was, I was just going to ask a question. You talk about uh, the fines and the progressive of fines for somebody who kind yes. of has a track record for doing this. Remind <coughs> me again what the what the fines are and what the progression is. For yeah, we're going to start with the $100 fine, which is what they gave for a late scratch last year. And they felt that that was enough to deter people that when they got that fine, it, you know, they weren't late again. Um, and we left it up to the judge's discretion um, to, as to what the progressive fine was going to be if somebody was um, late again and they'd already received the $100 fine. Um, because like we said, we don't want people to just have this become the way they do business right. or whatever. So right. we want it, this is going to be the exception um, and it will allow them to race, but it's not going to become a, a normal thing. That was my first, when I first read it, I was thinking, um, well, n now they're going to know they got to be there three hours and 45 minutes before. But that's, right. since you kept the fine in place, uh, that that really makes good sense to me, I think. And so yes. to, to accomplish, to do what you said, which is to keep it from becoming the new normal. Yes. And certainly if we needed to revisit, you know, next year or, or right. even partway through the year, if we need to revisit it, we can. Right. So. Mr. O'Toole, you're fine with it. You, do you have any other comments on, on, on it? No, I think it's a, I think it's a, a good, a good way to proceed because last year, as Alex pointed out, there was a few circumstances where horses were just in that time frame of being late and they were scratched, but it was circumstances beyond their control where we have so many shipping uh, horses from, uh, mostly coming down from Maine. We had a couple of times when 495 was tied up pretty well, and they, they would not have been scratched, but they would have been. Uh, find you know, and 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 also once uh, someone is late, um, 
and they know that it's going to be a progressive fine, uh, I'm right. sure that they'll leave a little bit earlier just to, uh, you know, not, not be in those circumstances again. So I, it, it does help. It helps the, uh, the owners. It helps the trainers. Um, and again, when we were in the discussions in the working group, um, I, I made the comment to Alex, uh, we don't want to make this a three hour and 45 minute rule just like what, what you were saying, not no longer a four, yeah. a four hour rule. And so I think this is a great way to proceed. Right. And it, it does build in a little protection, not only for the horseman, but also for the track because the track su suffers, handle suffers, and uh, horsemen's purses suffer when horses are scratched out of the fields. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think this working group has, is, a, is a great approach. Um, and I, and, and you know, I, again, uh, um, it's great that you've, you've done it. Will you continue that working group? What are the plans for? Well, we were just, um, charged with the two um, discussions. Actually, one of the other things was the post-race um, blood gas testing, which we also discussed in that group. Okay. Um, and so those were the two issues that we were you know, okay. charged with discussing. But certainly, okay. that's something that would be great to, if um, along the line we have yeah, other issues yeah. that come up, it'd be, it's great to have that group there, group of you know, basically experts and people who are involved with it that we can tap into. Yeah, and, um, yeah, no, it's, and it's just, great. And um, just speaking on the post-race um, blood gas testing, we also came up with a recommendation on that, that um, we um, move away from that and instead do more extensive testing on the regular blood and urine samples that we would be obtaining from those horses anyway. And that actually lets us cover more uh, different drugs and um, it's not cost prohibitive because um, in the past year, there were maybe three or four horses that the judges might have wanted to do this with. So it's not cost prohibitive on our part, um, and it also um, doesn't make the trainers have to stay around for the two hours after the race. And we mm. thought that would be good. And the same lab that we send our samples to? Yep, it would, would be, be the same lab, and our um, test barn coordinator would just note right on the sheet that she sends to she the sends. lab to do that extra testing. about okay. something else you talked about. I listened uh, to your, your thoughts, uh, 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 Dr. Lightbound, at, at the beginning, and you mentioned credit cards. Th those are credit cards for payment of license fees? Yes. Uh, yeah. <coughs> mm -hmm. not, not patrons. Uh, right, it's for right. Uh, licensees like uh, trainers, grooms, right. owners. Okay, yep. good, mm -hmm. good. I just thought that needed clarification. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. okay, next up. Now I'll turn it over to Doug, our senior financial expert to talk about the CAP fund. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, what, we, what you have in front of you is a memorandum addressed to the Massachusetts Gaming Commission regarding the Plain Ridge race course request, request for the Capital Improvement Trust Fund money. This is a request for consideration to purchase and install split mile markers uh, with additional scope of work totaling $13,820. Uh, this request was originally submitted by Mr. O'Toole, the general manager, um, back on February 9th. It was also submitted to Dixon Salo, who is the architectural firm that's contracted with the state to review these proposals. Um, Dixon Salo did, in fact, send us a letter recommending that this RFC be approved by the Gaming Commission. Uh, in the packet, you will find a quote from Horseman's Track for the the cost of the mile markers of $10,420, as well as the installation and the scope of work for $3,400. Uh, currently, Plain Ridge has uh, $238,000 in, the, in their cap fund, so there's obviously sufficient funds in there. Um, the process is, if, it is, if this RFC is approved by the commission uh, and the work is completed, Dixon Salo will go out and inspect the work that has been done, and if it is to their satisfaction, they will submit an approval letter to us um, to request that the funds can be distributed to Plain Ridge Racecourse, and a vote is a, a vote is required um, to move forward on this. Okay. Are there? Are you replacing existing markers? Uh, we are. The. Um as uh, Commissioner McHugh pointed out in, in previous meetings, the <clears throat> all the storm water drain off from the entire property flows under the uh, racetrack and into a filtration field and into a pond that was then uh, repurposed for irrigation. Um, so the infield has been disturbed. These, this request 
is a uh, component and actually a complement to some of the finished work of the, the project, but these types of things weren't included in the scope of the uh, of, of the prod, of the project ongoing project that's going on right now, so the, these will replace the ones that are out there. Uh, they're more decorative. They're more weather resistant. Uh, the other ones are old, and uh, it'll just you know when we finish off the infield, it'll be a good complement to the to the uh, aesthetics of the infield and the racing. Okay, I was able to see some of that firsthand yesterday with Steve. And uh, Steve, remind me the. The sign with the time that would be a future request from from these monies. You you had mentioned that you you're thinking about trying to replace some some of that signage. The infield tow board. Yes. Uh, the infield our infield tow board is, is is old. It wasn't a part of the of the original project. Um, right. I do have two buckets, yep. if you will. Um, I have a capital expenditure budget. Uh, uh, bucket from Penn. Yep. Um, I also have this uh, ongoing uh, bucket. Um, tote board is uh, an expensive item, yep. uh, but in within, uh, we've been looking at a two-year uh, uh, timetable okay. to replace our tote board. Um, but I think we might be able to maybe even get it done for next season. Great. So that's what uh, that's what maybe a combination of the two buckets to get that done. Great. But I do have we do have a few other projects that. I'll be keeping Doug busy with Great. Um, around, the, around the facility that weren't in the scope of the project that's going on now. Great. Th this raises a, an, a, uh, an aspect of, of the is this on? Yeah, an aspect of the um, racing process that I don't really understand. But it, when I first looked at this, it seemed to me like this was a pretty bureaucratic way to spend $13,000. Um, I look at the reg, and I guess it's I guess it's in I mean, at the uh, the uh, memorandum, and it looks like the process is prescribed by law. So we we have to hire an architect to make a decision and have you know to, on this. Um, do you have any idea what we paid the architect for the to, for this opinion? I'm not exactly sure of the fee. I, it is different every time they do come out to inspect, depending on the scope of the work and what they have to review. Right. Well, I'm just, I guess there's nothing we can do about it. It seems to me like this is, a, well, you know, it was back in February when you asked for permission. It's now four months later. Um, if, if there's any way we could expedite this, particularly for relatively minor expenditures, I don't know if there is, but maybe it's worth, Catherine, you could help take a look if there's, if there's anything we could do to, least have the option of considering delegating the ability say for us to say to the division to make these decisions or something like that it just seems like a real pain in the neck for a relatively and modest expenditure. absolutely and there's there's a lot of, that we could mirror of currently what we have especially on capital expenditures on the on the gaming act once a year for example right. uh, for all capital improvements yeah, right. Uh, right. which is what the what the gaming act prescribes Right. Um, isn't, isn't this one example of a, a number of little hidden canyons and bureaucratic uh, uh, bends that are embodied in 128A and 128C yes. that yep. cry out for a reorganization of the whole thing? Mm -hmm. It is. That, the, the CAP fund and the promo fund, essentially, we're, we're, we're a holding tank for, for the racetracks on that. That's, that's their money that that's we're holding. their money. Right, yes. right. That we're holding back to us and right. apply for their own money. Mm -hmm. Right. So <clears throat> examples of things like that. That. Right. Well, we're right. I. I so we. I think we are still planning on an omnibus. Right. Re, you know, uh, redo, and we need to figure out whether we're going to have thoroughbred racing. And um, but let's be keeping a check sheet somewhere because right. I, I. I. I think we're seems like we're all of a mind that the, that the, this is a little silly if we can figure out either in the interim how to get around it right. or at least at the time of, you know, right. the legislature's asking us to come back and say, how should we handle racing in the future? So right. add this to our list. Well, obviously, in, in the, in the race, when the Racing Commission was um, uh, in, in effect and we were, I was dealing with the Racing Commission, they were very involved and wanted to know what projects we'd be doing and how, how these monies were, would be spent and that we would actually be uh, reinvesting in the facility uh, for the patrons, for the horsemen, um, uh, and this was created, I think, back probably in the 80s, um, right. well, to make sure that, that there was capital improvements being done right. all the time. 
Yeah, well, I, I can understand that there's a, there is a public policy kernel in there somewhere, mm -hmm. but this may not be the way to accomplish right, it. Right, right. right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, keeping your mention of the word silliness in mind, uh, but I will uh, move that the uh, commission approve the Plain Ridge Race Course request for capital improvement <coughs> trust fund monies, uh, project HHCIT F2015-1 for $13,820, uh, subject to final and review and approval of, of, uh, of the project by our architectural firm. Second. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Is that it? You got another one? Uh, yes, uh, just an, an update on the local aid distributions. Uh, what, what you have in front of you is uh, computation for the quarterly payments to local <coughs> aid. Um, how this is done is it's six month in arrears for the handles and it's 0.35% of that handle which is distributed to the local towns where racing takes place, which would be Boston, Revere, Plainville, and Raynham. Um, again, this is done on a quarterly basis. Uh, it's an appropriation with an obligation ceiling for the annually of uh, $1,150,000. And we have never exceeded, since I've been here, we've never exceeded that amount. And this, this has been approved. The, the, the checks have been cut and written for this quarter. So that is taken care of. It's just something that we wanted. We don't need a vote on this, but we just wanted to bring it in front of the commission to make you aware. Okay. Doug, why did they ever have a cap? Do you know? Well, I'm not sure, Bruce. Okay. I, I believe that was instituted a number of years ago when, it, it, when they were, the handles were considerably higher where if it was on a 0.35% basis, it would have certainly exceeded that 1.15 million. Okay, thank you. Next up. Okay, next up is um, Plain Ridge's request for approval of their key operating personnel and their racing officials. This, again, is something that we um, do every year and uh, does require a vote by the commission. Uh, <clears throat> all of these um, people have put in their applications and paid for them. They've had their USTA and RCI records checked. Uh, they've been signed <coughs> off by our judges panel. Uh, most of them have been also signed off by the state police, but we do have a few that are still going through the background check. Um, everybody's been fingerprinted except for two that are going to be fingerprinted today, the last two. Okay. So um, what we usually do with these, since sometimes the background checks take a little bit with the uh, state police, is uh, we ask for approval pending their completion of their background checks and approval by the state police. Questions? So I give I, Mr. O'Toole a real good scrubbing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I just want to keep the faces to the names. Um, Tony uh, Ristiano, he, he gave the introduction at the meeting yesterday. Is that? Uh, that was that was uh, Anthony Salerno, Salerno, presiding judge. Yes. Okay. Great. There are a few. Uh, most of these. Uh, I'm happy to report that most most of the officials and, and key operating personnel are, are are back this year. But there are a couple of additions to the staff. Uh, Jay Savastano is the first time that he's been. Um, up for approval, he's new to the operation as assistant racing services manager to Lenny Calderon. Uh, Jay's expertise is in social media, so we're going to try and tie into the USDA program there with our, our social media. Um, and Dr. Jeremy Murdoch is a new addition as a racing veterinarian. Um, I think that's about it. Everybody else has been with us for quite some time. Great. And I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank Alex and echo your your thoughts. Uh, it's been a little bit of a rocky road there the last month or so, getting everything uh, whipped into shape for racing with the winter we had. And I know that um, Alex and, um, and her staff uh, dealing with the, the temporary trailer setup and, and everything is, we hope we've accommodated her needs, but I know sometimes we've fallen a little short and she isn't afraid to, get, to crack the whip on me, but... Uh, uh, I, ho I hope we've responded well, and she's been doing a great job. 
It's good to hear. Great. Mr. Stebbins, you want to move? Uh, are, we have another. There's a second page. Are there is a second page. There also? was um, one addition. Um, okay. <clears throat> Tracy, Chase. There we go. Yep. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that the, the commission pr approve uh, the Plain Ridge Park Casino request for uh, approval of the following key operating personnel and racing officials for the 2015 racing season um, and, uh, pursuant to any final, final background checks that need to be completed by the IEB. Second. Second. Yep. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. That it, Dr. Lightbaum? Yes, that's it. Thank you very much. And Mr. Day, I think that's everything. I have nothing further. I just have one uh, announcement. Um, I'm told that we will be having our next two meetings, April 30th and therefore uh, May 14th, in uh, this facility, not some of our friends went to the wrong place, went to the convention center, but we will be here at the Heinz for each of our next two meetings. Anything else? Motion to adjourn. Second? Second. Second. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Aye. Thank you. Thank you.